The following podcast is sponsored by Structure Tech. Tessa is here to criticize, condemn, and complain. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's just depressing. Welcome everybody. You're listening to Structure Talk, a Structure Tech presentation. My name is Bill Ulbrich, alongside Tessa Murray and Ruben Saltzman. As always, we are back to being a three-legged stool. I asked for <laughs> and received permission to use my three-legged stool analogy. Not like ask? I needed to, but you know, <laughs> I was. <laughs> I had a nice LinkedIn conversation with a podcast host who uses that very similar analogy. He does it in terms of business. So we're here, a three-legged stool. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about some projects that we've all been working on, or at least Ruben and I are going to talk about some projects we've been working on. And I'm sure Tess is going to hyperanalyze whether or not we're doing this right. That's what's on tap for today. So why don't you all say hi, get this thing going. Thanks for that very nice intro you gave me, Bill. <laughs> Was it not kind? <laughs> no, no, just I'll be picking apart all the things that you guys have worked on. Elsa is here to criticize, condemn, and complain. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's just depressing. No, uh, no. It was actually, Tessa, what it was is kind of an underhanded compliment. Is that is that what you call them? A, I think it's a uh, backhanded, right. backhanded compliment. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Tessa, that was a backhanded compliment because what I know is there isn't a single house you're willing to live into. Like it won't meet your standards, but it just happens that we have to live somewhere. So you go inside at some point and just accept the warts that are on that particular uh, piece of property. Yeah, Bill, it's a hard life, you know, having a building science mind and knowing about houses, you know, you're programmed to see the negative. But yes, to that point, the place I'm living in now has some major flaws that I am not okay with, but somehow I've learned to live every day with it. So yes, life goes on. The blood keeps pumping and the air yep. keeps getting exchanged through your lungs. It's all good. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. I should tell you guys about one of the reasons I initially came into the home inspection orbit, right? So I had known Ruben's dad, Neil, for a long time before that, but we did some work on our house and I did a bunch of research and I thought I was doing the right thing. And then I did it and I was like, uh oh, I'm not so sure this was the best decision. So then I had Neil come out. And at the time Neil came out, Barry was, he wasn't doing anything. So he showed up with Neil and they began to pick apart my house, which kind of led me down this. I learned a bunch about houses and then I thought, wow. I know a lot about houses already, but this was all new and it was great. And then I really started to worry about my house. The more they talked, the more I worried. <laughs> and then I got to the point where I just gave up. I just threw my hands in the air and I said, it's old, it's durable. I can't ruin it, at least not in the next 25 years. And at that point, I won't care. So I just moved on mentally. I'm glad you feel comfortable about that, Bill. And I don't want to burst your bubble, but you actually can, but here goes. Your, you actually can <laughs> ruin your house in 25 years. If you do the wrong things to it, you can take a really durable old house and really mess it up these days with a lot of the, the things that we do to make houses more energy efficient, more airtight, which I think is something that you're probably, you were insinuating when you said you, you did something, you're really concerned about what you did. Didn't you have a project where you did a lot of coastal spray foam in like a kind of like a slant ceiling area in your house? Yeah. And I completely followed the expert's recommendations. I for once said, I'm going to get out of the way mm -hmm. and not mess with the cooks in the kitchen. And then I started freaking out afterwards. You know, in theory, like a lot of these energy improvements are really good things and reducing overall air leakage of the house and making it more airtight so it's more energy efficient, more comfortable, less heat loss. But in reality, in the real world, executing that scope of work perfectly is really hard to do. And in some places, the way that the roof is framed or so you've got a two by four framing this attic space and you can't get adequate insulation in there, you're still going to have some snow melt and thermal bridging and then you won't have any ventilation and you change all these, you know, the, the durability factors by reducing drying potential, by doing all this air sealing work, and you can actually create more problems than when you started with. So as long as a house can can dry out and you've got heat and airflow going through it, it will last hundreds and hundreds of years. But as soon as you start reducing that heat flow and that energy, 
you can start to wrap things out and create big problems. Well, the whole reason we got onto this topic was because <laughs> Ruben has been messing around with his house and making it much more vulnerable. Maybe we should let Ruben explain. How dare you? How dare you, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> well, this this is the follow up on that podcast where we had Rob Vasallo on. It was I think we titled that podcast. Uh, There's no such thing as a settlement crack. We did that a little while ago, and during that episode, we talked about solar tubes. Tessa, I challenged you and Rob to talk me out of installing a solar tube in my home. I had already purchased a solar tube the day before, so it was sitting in my garage ready to go in. And <laughs> you guys did not talk me out of it. And I'll tell you what, as soon as that podcast was over. I, as soon as we were done recording, I was on my roof within less than an hour of that podcast, cutting a hole in it to get that thing installed. So I, wow. I did do it. I, I installed the solar tube. I've, I've installed a handful of them. I've, I've put them in every house I've owned because uh -huh. I love those things. And I've always done the 10 inch, but this time I went for the big boy. I went for the, the 14 inch <laughs> and you know, four inch difference doesn't seem like much, but man, that is a difference when you're working with that thing on the roof and you got to mess with the flashing kit and all that. It is a lot of work. You know what, Ruben, do you want to describe what a solar tube is to people that may not know? Oh yeah. Good point, Tess. Basically on your roof, you've got this big dome. It's a big plastic dome that sticks up above your roof. It connects to a big metal tube that runs down through your attic and it's going to connect to what looks like a light fixture at your ceiling. It's just this big round thing that mounts on your ceiling. Typically they're going to be 10 inches or 14 inches in diameter. And it really can look like a light fixture. I'll, I'll never forget mm -hmm. the home inspection where there was this agent going all over the kitchen. She was so flustered. I'm like, what are you trying to do? She's like, I'm trying to shut that light off. <laughs> yeah, sure. they do. They do look like light fixtures. Yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. They're kind of like a, like a round cylindrical, like skylight, basically. That's, yeah, that's about it. It's just like a skylight. It lets in tons of natural mm -hmm. light. And it, I mean, it'll brighten up in a big area. Area. Mm -hmm. yep. So what room did you put it in? There is a second floor bathroom with no windows in it. So we stuck it in there. I mean, it's just, it's always dark. It, it's very uninviting. It's the darkest room in the house and other than the basement rooms. And now it's just, I mean, you can see light pouring out of there. It lights up the whole hallway. It's awesome. I love it. And everybody should get one. And you can <laughs> order them from me at... No. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of pros to them. And I agree with you. Like they, they let in natural light. They can brighten up a space. And the only beef I have with them is that, yeah, it's another potential, well, you're, you're poking a hole in your roof and a hole through your, your ceiling. So it's potential areas for water to leak in if it's not flashed properly or got some other issues. And also the, the hole from the ceiling to the attic could, if it's not sealed properly, could, you know, allow heat and moisture into the attic and our cold climate and create issues with frost and, you know, and heat loss and all that. But another thing that can happen too, which I've seen in other houses is people install these, these solar tubes through a really like tiny little attic space where there's not a lot of volume. Mm -hmm. yep. And then if you're not insulating that tube, there's going to be some radiant heat coming off of it just from the sunlight, natural sunlight that radiates and heats up that small attic space. And that can actually melt the snow on your roof, which can lead to ice dam. Yep. So the right. recommendation is to, you know, air seal around that solar tube where it goes through the, the attic into the house. So you're not having heat loss and air leakage that way, but then also wrap it in insulation or spray foam it so that you don't have the radiant heat getting into the attic space and warming up the attic and melting the snow. But you don't have a tiny attic space, do you? You've got a pretty no, big it's huge. attic. I, I had to buy a couple of extenders for this tube to get from the ceiling to the roof in that attic space. So it's, wow. I mean, it's taller than I am. There's a lot of space. So I really yeah. don't have to worry about ice dams. I'll send you a picture. I mean, the yeah. roof is covered with snow and and you look on the roof and the snow doesn't know that this thing exists. I'll <laughs> well, tell you good. that. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 You should post a picture in the show notes. I will. In the podcast notes. But to your point, Tess, I mean, that, that is a really good point you bring up. When you have a really tight clearance between your ceiling and the roof, you got a big potential for, for melt. 
And mm -hmm. I had that at a home that I used to own in Minneapolis. And I ended up that that was the house where I did the hot roof. And at the same mm -hmm. time, I had them spray the heck out of that whole tube. I mean, they mm -hmm. insulated all around that whole thing. And despite all of that insulation, I would still get snow melting around it. Really? So it's wow. just the volume of your attic space makes yeah. such a dramatic difference on your yeah. potential for ice dams. Yeah. Yep. yep definitely. That's a good point. Air sealing, insulation, and ventilation. You got all those three things and you should be fine. You'd be proud of me when I was done. In fact, I sent you a picture, Tess. When I was yep. all done with this, I used an entire can of great stuff or, you know, that foam in the can that you buy at the store just to foam the intersection between the ceiling and the solar tube. So that is buttoned up tightly. I looked into getting one of those froth packs like you and Rob were trying to talk me into so I could really properly insulate that tube. But those things are like two, 300 bucks. Yeah. I mean, it is a lot of money for one of those things. And I yeah. just said, you know what? I'm not worried about this. I'm not spending mm -hmm. the money on it. I'm calling it good enough. And I think in this situation, it sounds like it is. You know, there are some attics in some spaces where you might need that or you, you want that. But in terms of a, like a return on investment, you probably won't see that if you're spending the $200, $300 on the broth pack. Exactly. And you know what? Let me share this little bit of advice. As I get older, I don't feel old. I'll tell you, I felt old when I was done on the roof putting this thing on. Because, <laughs> I mean, I tried to really follow the installation instructions. It said, pull all the shingles off around here. Then they want you to cover up that whole area with ice and water shield and put oh. it over the vent and slide it up and put all the shingles back and caulk the heck out of it. Mm. And I mean, it took a while and I've got a fairly steep roof. I mean, I, I don't know. I think it's like a, in somewhere between an 8, 12 and a 10, 12. So it's, oh, wow. it's not comfortable to walk on, no. but I had my cougar paws on. So I felt comfortable. And, you know, as a home inspector, we can walk around on a roof for five, 10 minutes and we're cool. But once you're on there, just standing in the same spot for a couple of hours, it is exhausting. I mean, my legs just felt like jelly. I had to walk down from my roof so slowly when I was done. I was frozen to the core because it was a windy day. My vent blew off the roof too. I lost my flashing kit, had to go uh. find it on the ground. It was just... <laughs> It was not fun. And I just thought, you know what? I, I'm pretty sure this is the last solar tube I ever install. I had been meaning to do this all year, but I was waiting till it was cool enough to where I wouldn't die in the attic. Yeah. And I waited just a little too long. I mean, it's almost like there's no great temperature. I'd say maybe 50 degrees is perfect. 30 yeah. degrees, too cold to be working on your roof. Mm -hmm. 70 degrees, way too hot to be in your attic. Where did you get the shingles? And didn't they break when you were, you know, trying to put this, take these shingles off and put them back in? I mean, weren't they all sealed down? I did have to break the seals on them to do this. I used a putty knife. I was very careful. And I used a bunch of the same caulk that I used to seal down the, the flashing. I used that to reseal all the nailing strips on my shingles. Oh, so you just reuse the same shingles. Exactly. Wow. And if you're careful and tedious, you can do it. It's just, that's what took me so long. That's why I was up there for so yeah. long. It was, I didn't know you had to do the ice and water underneath that too. That, this yeah. was the first one I did that way. On the on the 10 inch ones, I didn't have to. Either that or they changed mm. their installation instructions. Yeah. But for the big mama, they required it. <laughs> and I just happened to have a roll of ice and water in my garage. And I was so thankful I hadn't thrown it away from my last project. You so know, I was like, oh, good. I, so you were doing all this on a 10, 12 pitch without, like you know any it might have been a 912 did your wife see you doing this she's like i don't want you up there i'm like anna you know what i do for a living she's like yeah you sit in your office all day <laughs> I'm like yeah touche Good luck. <laughs> was it on the, the tall side where your walkout is no it's it's in between the walkout and the front so it's okay. it's on a semi-tall side it would have yeah. been a far fall yeah, it would not have been a good fall. It's way up there. Wow. So that's why they have those cherry picker things. I can't do that. Any I can't do that. Those, those roof heights anymore. I just freak out. Like there's. I don't a think I can either. I think this is my last project like that. I mean, I'll still yeah. walk on the roof or something, but next project I have that's going to require more than about 15 minutes on the roof. That is a younger man's game or a younger woman's game. 612 or less for me if I was doing something like that. I don't think I'd feel comfortable on anything stoop steeper that high up. Oh, when you're talking six, six and 10, and I always get those confused. 
Yeah, me too. I really don't know. I'll measure the slope and or pitch and I'll tell you what it was. And I'll take a picture. I'll take a picture of snow around that area. It's a wonderful project. It, it brings in a lot of light and it's a good project to do when it's not super cold. That's my two cents on it. So you're saying this is a DIY project. It's not I, a problem. It's an advanced DIY project. It's not a simple DIY, but it can be done. There's a couple of really good videos out there showing you step-by-step step how to do it on YouTube, how to install a solar tube. There's one where this, there's this woman and she's got her tool belt on and she's like, we're going to do this. And she takes you through it expertly through every little step of the way. And it's just this petite little thing. And I'm like, all right, look at her, look at her go. She is <laughs> nailing this and making this look so easy. What am I doing? I've already done several of these. Why am I considering? considering even hiring this out. This is a piece of cake. You know what though, but that's a, that's a contractor who probably has some experience and she's also got a camera that can do some edits. So I'm just, yeah. think about all the potential errors where here we go again, I'll be, I'll be the Debbie Downer. I, there's so many people I would not trust to cut a hole in their roof. I'd be afraid that they would cut through a truss or like, who knows what they could do, fall off the roof. I'll tell you, I must have spent probably about an hour laying everything out before getting to the point of cutting that hole. It was a matter of where does it go in the bathroom? Where does mm -hmm. it look good? Where are the trusses? Where does it go on the roof? Oh, wait, right. no, we got a vent here. And it's up through the attic, crawling to the other side, back down. I mean, there was a yeah. lot of layout involved before I ever got to the point of cutting a hole. You There's know, when Ruben says DIY, like for Ruben, it might be DIY, but for the rest of the population, I feel like that is an expert level thing. Like that's something that you would probably want to hire out. Possibly so. I did grow up doing construction. That helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it does make it different. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bill, what are you working on, man? Our biggest project right now is we're in the planning phases of the cabin. So we have a property way up north, up on the Canadian border, which is which has been a front project. But when we bought it, the cabin was it was termed a teardown. And we thought, no, we can save this. We're gonna milk a few years out of this. Eh, it's torn down. It's gone already. The amount of mice that shared the space with us humans got to be a little bit unnerving. In the summertime, they were, I mean, we'd go to bed and you're like, what? They were right there. <laughs> so, so yeah, but so we had to go to the county. We had to start at the county. But the one thing I knew going into it was, yeah, we're close to the water. And I knew there was going to be some flood zone issues just because of proximity. We can fix those, but it might get a little weird around the cabin with having to bring in some fill or the cabin sticking out of the ground, like four feet out of the ground and just looking a little bit goofy. That's not uncommon up there. But when I was told by a mortgage company that I needed flood insurance, I was like, oh boy, is this really, really what I want to do for the rest of my life is pay flood insurance? So we're repositioning the cabin a little bit farther up the hill, but our property out there, we're locked in by a side yard setback. We're locked in by, we can't go any closer to the lake. And I actually have a municipal sewer easement that goes across my property because we don't have a septic system on our property. We actually have city sewer. And up there, it's all bedrock. They had to like side drill through bedrock. And, and so wherever they did this drilling, you can't build on top of their pipe, which gave us a really narrow, small footprint to get it in. And I was going to have to do all kinds of weird things. And, but now that I'm going up the hill, I've got a little more, a little more room to work with. So we're in the process of laying out the cabin. I'm working with a contractor. I drew up the plans myself. I'm a draftsman. Wow. I didn't know that, Bill. I'm not good. I'm not good <laughs> at it. But I kind of understand where everything's going to be. And now we're just in the process of getting it priced out. We were hoping that it would be done kind of middle of summer. But Rob has got me way. He, he says, no way, because I have to dry this thing out for 45 days or something. Run a dehumidifier in it. What a wet rag he is, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to do that. I mean, I get the logic behind it. Maybe we'll just go slow and get the shell up early and let it sit all summer and then start putting insulation in it later in the year. Mm -hmm. But right now, that's the biggest thing. And, How many uh, square feet is it, Bill? A little under a thousand. Okay. It's like 890 something square feet. 
two bedroom or two bedroom yeah bath? two bedroom two bath two bath okay. but the bathrooms are tiny they're just they're like yeah i don't know they're just there for function not for leisure <laughs> that's right <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah yeah that's right and then there's going to be a little loft in it ladder up to the loft so no staircase <laughs> we don't have any way to get water there either unless i want to drill a really really deep well so we need to put a cistern in the crawl space underneath the cabin really i was so i was surprised when you said you were connected to the city sewer system up there i thought you were on like septic system but so there's no city water supply to it no we're we're a little ways away from town but it was important that they be able to treat the waste around the lake there's no pollution going in the lake and so it made sense to do the municipal sewer but i'm not sure it made sense to bring water out to all these houses yeah that's all i'm working on i'm just in planning phases and we got to wait for frost to get out of the ground which is i guess mid-june in international falls <laughs> you have two months to build just kidding that's right <laughs> <laughs> tessa i need to ask you about this building before we move on to something else because it's going to be like a chalet style roof and i'm not sure how we should insulate the ceiling i was hoping that we would be able to just do it with like cellulose insulation and have enough room mm -hmm. and i was going to use what are called attic trusses in the area that was going to be the loft and then we would just use whatever eye joists or some other material to mm -hmm. actually build a vault in our living room area, which so would go floor to ceiling. If I'm looking at insulating that space, what's the best way to approach it? I mean, I know we can use bat. I know we can use closed cell spray foam, and mm -hmm. I know we can use cellulose. But if this material is, you know, maybe nine inches maximum thickness on these attic trusses, mm -hmm. is that going to be enough room to get enough insulation in? into you know, that area to in, sort of meet our current building standards? Gosh, Bill, there's so many parts to this question. I don't even know where to start. In terms of like building science and building performance, it's really all about being able to control the air layers and the thermal boundary of the house and preventing any sort of, you know, air leakage between the conditioned space and the unconditioned space. Because when you have that air leakage, then you have moisture and you don't want moisture getting into these tiny little attic spaces because that creates frost. It can rot out your roof deck. It can create all sorts of problems. So it's really important to have a consistent, what we call like an air barrier. And that's different from your thermal boundary, which is your insulation layer. And ideally in, in like perfect world, your air barrier and your insulation would be aligned and they would be continuous. You don't want any breaks in those, in those two layers. So you're talking about a complicated kind of roof truss, it sounds like. One that, if you picture it, you've got this loft space, but really the truss is kind of one, one system that has this like cutout in the center for living space. So really, when you think about it, you've kind of got almost like a story and a half type roof style where you've got these almost like a side attic space, like with kind of a triangle shape attic space. And then you've sure. got this slant as you move up the slant right. space. And then you've got this upper peak, kind of like another triangle attic space with this truss. And so when you think about it, how do you get a continuous, you know, air barrier and thermal boundary when you've got one, two, three different attic spaces and lots of different framing angles? How do you get a consistent air sealed layer and consistent insulation? And the tricky part is building in our frozen tundra, you need a lot of insulation too. Ideally, our current building code requires an R49. That's a lot of insulation. So I don't know how much space you'll have in those slant areas, but that's kind of the one probably challenging space to get enough insulation in those slants to prevent, you know, heat loss and air leakage. And even if you do fill those slants, Ruben, I know you had this problem in your story and a half house in Minneapolis. You actually filled those cavities between the rafters with closed cell spray foam as much R value as possible, but you still had problems with snow melt. Why? Because we didn't have any type of thermal break for the rafters. Wood is a horrible insulator. Mm -hmm. And every 16 inches, I had a two by four. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do anything to stop the cold th coming through that or the heat from coming from through leaving. it. Mm -hmm. So if we had covered the underside, the interior of the whole attic space mm -hmm. with maybe one to two inches of rigid foam boards, we mm -hmm. probably would have eliminated that, but mm -hmm. I didn't know it at the time. Well, so Bill, one interesting thing is with these, these trusses, like there's lots of different 
different air sealing options, right? Options, right? The cheapest assembly is like a fiberglass bat in poly vapor barrier. But I'd say it's also probably the riskiest type of assembly because to get that poly plastic vapor barrier installed perfectly with no holes, no breaks, no inconsistencies is really difficult on that complicated roof truss design. And the fiberglass bats are kind of, they're okay, but it doesn't have the highest R value per inch. Cellulose, you could use cellulose in the slant areas and that's a, you know, a little bit better R value per inch. And they also kind of, cellulose will reduce air leakage. It won't prevent it, but it will reduce it more than the fiberglass bath. So it's a little bit more forgiving in terms of if you have some little breaks in that air barrier and you do have moisture getting up into the space, it's a little bit more forgiving. But kind of the one product that does the air sealing and the best insulation is the closed cell spray foam, but it needs to be installed properly. And, you know, you don't want to have any breaks or misses in that either. And once you install that closed cell spray foam, you know, you still may not be able to achieve that ideal R49 in some of those slant areas. And so how do you prevent thermal bridging from happening? Like what Ruben had on his house? Well, you could do, you know, rigid foam on the inside or what I've seen done on, a, on some story and a half houses that had this issue was a layer of rigid foam was actually added to the roof deck on the exterior. So there was actually like a double roof deck that was built. You picture your trusses, you spray in the closed cell spray foam, you put the roof deck on, then you add a layer of rigid foam on top of that. And then you need to actually add another roof deck on top of that, something you can nail the shingles to. But the ideal thing is to actually create some sort of airspace between the rigid foam and that upper layer of roof deck material so that you can have continuous ventilation underneath that roof deck to prevent any sort of potential moisture issue or melt issue as well. So you add these little sleepers, you know, in between the foam and the roof deck. That would be a very, you know, robust, like as Pat Hellman would say, you'd be proud of me for using this word, robust system, having, you know, consistent air barrier and air sealing through the closed cell spray foam, highest R value per inch, and then doing some sort of rigid foam on top of that with the continuous ventilation. But probably the most expensive option as well. And, you know, if somebody wanted to see what you're talking about, Tessa, if you Google up Thermacal, GAF, actually, I don't know if they bought Thermacal or what, but when I Google it up, it takes me to GAF's website and they have a nice picture of what this looks like, where you've got, you've got basically a roof sheathing sitting on top of little sleepers and it's a, mm -hmm. it's a pre-manufactured product. Not that you need to buy their product, but just shows you what, what you're talking about. Yeah. And actually, you know, what to that point too. So Building America is a program funded by U.S. Department of Energy. And there's a lot of different researchers across the country that are working Working towards improving the energy efficiency of our existing housing stock. And actually, Pat Hellman from the University of Minnesota, we had him on as a guest. He is working on this project as part of the Northern Star team here in Minnesota, and he's got some other great people working with him. But there's a research document about this very thing, Bill. You could look up this paper that he put together. It's called Project Overcoat an exploration of exterior insulation strategies for one and a half story roof applications in cold climates. <laughs> it doesn't get any more scientific or specific than that, but that research paper has some good images and some good research on that system. I like the looks of this thermocal thing. This is very interesting. It looks like it would go on quickly. It's got tons of venting in it. It's got this continuous layer. It almost looks to a degree like a sip. I like the look of it. I'm not going to be there when all this stuff is going on. And I, I was thinking to myself that maybe the easiest product to use would just take your normal floor joist that has all that, you know, like open webbing and just use those as your roof trusses and then blow in all kinds of cellulose insulation into that and somehow make sure you have enough of an air gap at the top mm -hmm. and just plug that up with cellulose mm -hmm. and you'd probably get close. How, how many inches of cellulose do you need to get to an R49? Well, what is cellulose? Is it like an R three and a half per inch? So yeah, that's right. Have to bust out that? the calculator. Yeah, me too. Divided by three, three and a half. Four, yeah. 14 inches. 14 that's a lot. Half, that's a like big, that. thick, that's a big, thick floor choice up in your roof. So I don't like that idea. You know, some people might say, well, why wouldn't you just use a SIP panel, right? Like, you know, those panels that are 
you know, that you've got the rigid decking on the exterior and the rigid on the inside, the structure on both sides, and then the insulation in the middle sandwiched in between. And I've seen them used in our cold climate here. And I, I actually have seen more failures than I've seen successes with them. And the problem is with our extreme temperature swings here in Minnesota, you know, it gets really cold in the winter and it's warm inside. And so you get different expansion contraction rates of the inside panel and the exterior panel. And what happens is those seams between the panels become weak points. And eventually what will happen is those seals will fail at the seams and warm, humid air will get in between the panels and basically rot out the wood structure on the interior and exterior of those panels at the scene. When I worked for that insulation company, the home performance company years ago, we had a, a huge project on a SIP panel house that had all these failures on it. And it was a really expensive project to fix that, like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to redo those seams on those SIP panels. And it's, it's, it's a fix, but I don't even know if it's a guaranteed fix and for how long it will last. So how would you feel about using that eye joist material with spray foam. Would you feel at all comfortable like that webbing is durable enough if it ends up getting wet and, or would you want more of a, a solid wood surface that could be a little more durable if it, if it ever did get wet for whatever reason? Well, instead of prioritizing the durability of products, I would first try and prioritize reducing the potential for moisture and air getting into that space in the first place. So like, you know, doing some sort of, if you did a layer of closed cell spray foam against the lid, you know, to achieve that consistent air barrier and vapor barrier, then I'd be less concerned about what material you have in the attic or for the framing if you did that, because then, the, you know, that's going to reduce the potential for moisture getting up there in the first place. And then having some sort of ventilation in that space will help too. But I mean, to answer your question, like, you know, the composite wood materials that we use today are not as durable as a solid piece of wood from a tree that was, you know, cut down a hundred years ago. Ruben, you've got a nickname for a lot of the composite wood products that we use today. What do you call that stuff? I just stole that from Don Sivany at the Minnesota Department of okay. Labor and Industry. He calls it was wood. Yeah. Because it used to be wood. At one time okay. it was wood. Was wood. And now it's something completely different. Yeah. The problem with that stuff is, you know, like you're talking about the wood eye joists and stuff. It's made up of chunks of wood glued together and pressed. And, and when that stuff gets wet, it just, you know, it turns to mush. Last question on this topic and we can move on because my head is spinning in this planning phase already. <laughs> Have you seen where somebody will come in with just three quarters of an inch of rigid styrofoam and they'll put that up as if it were drywall on all of the vaulted area, then go to the outside spray in that spray foam to give you that continuous layer of protection that you're talking about, then put the roof deck down? Or is that like a backwards installation? I've never seen that, but I think you could do it. And that's what Ruben, you were talking about doing that in your story and a half house. You wish you would have put rigid foam on the interior to reduce the thermal bridging. That's not what I was thinking of. I just had to think through what Bill was describing and it makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. but wait a minute. No, you can't do it that way, Bill. I'm sorry. No. The reason being is the building code only allows you to do a hot roof if that insulation is applied directly to the roof decking. So it's a solid no. It's not an option. It wouldn't be a hot roof because the spray foam would be built up from the bottom cord of your truss up, leaving an air gap for ventilation. You wouldn't fill that whole space. You'd still have it vented. Oh, mm -hmm. well, then I suppose you could. Yeah. I mean, in theory, I guess, having the rigid foam on the inside and uh, being your thermal break between the wood framing and the inside, and then having the spray foam applied directly to the back of that consistently across all of that framing would create a consistent air seal. And then you could use a, a cheaper, less expensive insulation to kind of achieve the required R value if you had enough space. That's what a lot of people do. I mean, I can't think of a single house if you had a, a large attic where you would want to fill the whole floor of the attic with a closed cell spray foam just because of the cost of it. Yeah. And it doesn't make sense. You, you, you know, you spray two inches of it to get your vapor barrier and your air seal, and then you blow in a less expensive insulation on, on top of it to achieve your R value. So if you've got a huge attic space, well, that's the way to go. Not only the materials and all the expense but the time because yeah. with that stuff you can't install more than what is it two inches of insulation at one time one pass or whatever yeah, yeah because you got to let it cool off and if if you just try to build it all up 
it's going to get too hot. It's what is it? It's a exothermic reaction or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you can actually start houses on fire by doing that. It yeah. gets crazy warm. Yeah. So yeah. And how long in between each pass do you need to let it cool down, Tess? Well, if you're spraying it just, you know, one, one pass at a time, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't take too long. I don't have the exact number on that. We should have a spray foam expert on, but right. I've seen, I've seen it contractors kind of do one pass on one wall. And then once they're done, head back and start again and, and do it. So, I mean, there's strategy to it and you have to be I, careful. I yeah. question if that's okay or not. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I've never seen a house start on fire, but uh, we'll get a spray, it spray foam expert on here. Yeah, we should. Yeah. Good idea. I'm cool. currently thinking about eliminating the loft area and just have a normal roof because this is turning into a pretty complicated project. <laughs> you know what? Here's the thing about building science. Like the simpler, the better, like the simpler, the roof design, it's so much easier to get a perfect air seal and good insulation and good ventilation. The simpler, the better. The more complicated yeah. your roof lines, the more dormers you get, the more vaults you have, the more side attics, the more slants, the more complicated it gets to create a consistent thermal boundary and air boundary, pressure boundary. Yeah, you're you're going balls out complicated, Bill. <laughs> I never met a project that I didn't want to complicate. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> What else are you guys working on? Well, I can tell you, Tessa, you'd be happy about this one. I mean, I, I told you about this solar tube and I, I knew I'd get yeah. crap from you on that, but <laughs> I just replaced my water heater and you'll be happy to know I replaced it with a power vent water heater. Hey, I know you I'm so proud of you, Ruben. What, right, made, right? You, what made you do that? <laughs> uh, the fact that the last one was a power vent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I thought you were going to say something like, well, you know, my last one was backdrafting and I was worried about, you know, my kids and my, my wife's health and the risk for backdrafting and carbon monoxide, but it wasn't any of that. It was just the fact that I didn't really have a choice. <laughs> I had to go power vent. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what though, you guys, with those power vent water heaters, I was trying to get one with like a 12 year warranty because I was yeah. replacing one with a six year warranty. It doesn't exist. They don't really? make power vent water heaters with anything other than a six year warranty. And wow. I was super annoyed by that because here in Maple Grove, all of our water heaters fail after like six, seven, eight years. I mean, that's all they last. I've helped several neighbors replace their own water heaters after at the seven year mark because wow. our water is horrible. So I thought, well, I'm going 12 years this time. No, nope, no such luck. Can't do it. I, I will say though that I, I went to Home Depot to get my water heater and you can buy an extended warranty from Home Depot. It, it extends the manufacturer's warranty by like five years or something. And the cost was 70 bucks. And now if anything- That's it? That's it. 70 bucks for five years? Yes. Yes. I couldn't wow. believe it. I felt like I was stealing from them purchasing this warranty. Yeah. I mean, wow. I would have paid a lot more for it. And so now if anything goes wrong with this and get this, here's, here's the kicker. It covers the installation costs next time. Like oh they, will, they will do it themselves. And I mean, I read that fine print because I was like, no, yeah. this cannot be. Yep. That's really what it is. So wow. my advice is if you're in an area with really bad water, get your water heater from Home Depot and buy that warranty. They are going yeah. to be paying through the nose when the time comes. This is a fairly new program that they have because I know the last time I got a water heater from them, they didn't have this. So that's, that's interesting. Well, as soon as the word gets out and people start doing this, that program might go away. So <laughs> get it while you exactly. can. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I will say this water heater replacement did not go smoothly. I've replaced a lot of water heaters for myself and friends and family. And usually it's pretty quick and easy, you know, throw in a couple of unions at the top to make it easier for the next person. But on this one, somebody had already replaced the water heater and they had made cuts in the copper tubing and they had soldered new pieces in. So there's nowhere I could make a nice clean cut. I had to go way back to the beginning and I had to put in all this new copper tubing. And it was just, it was a pain in the butt. And even today, Minnesota now allows those flexible connectors to connect to your water heater. And I thought, mm -hmm. you know what? I don't want to mess with all this sweating. I don't want to yeah. solder new pipes. I'm just going to get a couple of these flex guys and call it a done deal. The way it worked out was there was nowhere to put them where it was the right length. Either it was oh. too long or too short. Oh, no. And I, and I had to kink them to get them to connect to the water heater. Uh. So I ended up having to return them and spend like, you know, an extra hour and a half sweating 
cutting pipe. I'm sure it would have taken a competent plumber like 10 minutes to do it, but a competent plumber, I'm not. I, I can do enough to get by and it'll work wow. and not leak, but it takes me a long time. And what a pain in the butt it is. It so just... you're saying you're saying this project took you probably like, what, three hours instead of an hour and a half? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe even four hours. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a trip to the store to get the water heater and then another trip to get more copper fittings that I, I didn't originally anticipate needing. Yeah, it's like, you got to have a gopher. I can't wait till my kids are old enough where I can send them to the store for this stuff. That'll be <laughs> I'd have a very low confident threshold that if I sent my kid to the store to pick up anything related to hardware, I can't even figure out what I need. I go buy multiple things and then bring them all home, sort through it and return <laughs> everything that I didn't use just so yeah. I didn't have to go back and forth four times. Yeah. Man, I remember working at returns at Home Depot and you would come in, Bill, and you would, <laughs> you would come in with about a year's worth of leftover <laughs> projects. And it's like, it's like a, a huge cart just filled with bags and bags and oh. they're all different trips. And there's like a receipt in every one of the bags. And it's like 20 trips over the last year and we're returning everything that's left over. And, oh. and they just turn around and they'd apologize to the people in line. Like, yeah, sorry, you might want to read a book or something. It's going to be a while. It was always the worst. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> but you take them hd takes everything back so that's one more reason to shop there right they never give you any grief no matter how long you've had it it's so much easier now when you swipe your credit card i mean this was back in the day where you had to have all your receipts mm -hmm. oh my goodness what a pain in the butt that was at least we've made some progress you know on another podcast we got to talk about home depot's old return policy do you guys did you guys ever know about their old return policy where you could return anything and get cash back yes no Yes. Yes. Back wow. when I started at Home Devo in, in 99, that was the policy. You return stuff with a valid ID and they will give you cash back for your return. And wow. you can only imagine the type of people that brought in and the stuff that they were returning. It, oh, oh boy. Man, that's so many stories. Oh my gosh. But that'll be for another day. Yeah, that sounds well, good. Well, we should probably put a wrap on this one. We've been rambling on, especially about very technical stuff in the attic and the trusses and, and getting that right. So thank you, Tessa, for sharing your expertise again. I'm more frightened than I was before we started <laughs> this conversation. But You're welcome. Ruben, what did you say I was good at? The three C's? Criticizing, Criticism. condemn, and complain. There you go. Check, check, and check. <laughs> yes, you did all of them. Good job, Tess. All right. The day we're working on the roof, I'll make sure you're on the job site, keeping track <laughs> of the guys and, and the ladies. I'm not sure what the crew looks like, but you need to be there because surely it'll get done, but I'm not sure it'll be up to your standards. Gosh, you know, I don't mean to crush the hopes and dreams of you, Bill, or, you know, of this cabin, but Building science is a real thing. You know, when you're talking about vault in a cold climate, then it's pretty risky. So I'm going to let everybody just ponder that thought, how risky <laughs> vaults are in a cold climate. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening. You've been listening to Structure Talk, a Structure Tech presentation. My name is Bill Ulrich. That person you just heard laughing is Tessa Murray. And Ruben Saltzman is there still flexing his knees from the four hours he spent on his roof yes. putting in the new solar vent. Amen. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll catch you next time. For more information on how we can provide you with the right information about your home before you buy or sell, contact us at StructureTech.com.